I hate using the word, but I'll, I will use it only once just because I never want to give power to the word. I've, I've uh, you know, it, it, very, very uh, uh, elitist, very orientalist, very racist to a certain extent. How do you mean elitist? Racist? Well, I will say it this way. When you're sitting down looking at what was happening and you're saying that's part of their culture, what do you mean by that? Hassan, thank you so much for this opportunity. You are the man who brought the World Cup to the Middle East for a first ever Winter World Cup. Now, one week in, in your view, how has the tournament progressed thus far? Uh, I mean, if you look at it from two points of view, you know, or two different topics on the football side, I think everybody can, you know, <laughs> can clearly see it's it's been great. It's been phenomenal. You got great upsets, historic upsets: Saudi, uh, Argentina, uh, Japan, Germany. Uh, you've got, you know, you've had great matches, exciting matches. For example, England, uh, Iran, and then Iran, Wales. So from a footballing perspective, it's been great, and we've always said this is this is probably going to be one of the greatest uh, um, tournaments in terms of football. Outside of the stadiums, it's been phenomenal. I mean, I don't know. I'm sure you know, Jim Simon. You guys have walked around the yep. you know the souks, met met fans from all over the world. Absolutely. It's 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 re you know we've always said this is the greatest cultural event, and really it's a cultural cultural celebration out there. Fans from you know from from Korea wearing the the Arabic you know the, the menswear. It's banter. It's ribbing. It's celebration. It's it's what this world, the first World Cup in the Arab world in the Middle East, was always what well, we always promised it to be. It's 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 being delivered. In your view, do you think people had already made their mind up on Qatar? And do you believe that some of these same people are unlikely to change their view of your country? I think, unfortunately, a lot of people have uh, consumed a lot of misinformation out there without checking it. And unfortunately, it's formed, they formed opinions on it with, without looking at the facts or without digging deeper. Um, whether they'll be able to change it or not, again, you know, I, I, I can't comment on that. What I can say, however, is you talk to a lot of people out, they're having, they're having the times of their lives out here. Mm. And, and, and it's, it's changing their perception, not only of Qatar, of the Arab world, of the Middle East. And people over here, they're embracing and they're welcoming people from different parts of the world. And there's truly a, a cultural exchange, in, in, in my opinion, on an unprecedented level. So before a ball was kicked then, Hassan, why do you think a Middle Eastern World Cup had been perceived in such a negative fashion? Misinformation. And I think also it feeds into a stereotype of the Middle East and the Arab world. But I think for a lot of people, sorry, Simon, just, just to finish on. that statement. I think for a lot of people, you know, for some people, it's easy to believe the negative about our part of the world. It's easy to believe the negative about us. And it feeds into, unfortunately, a stereotype that might have been lasted or might have been depicted over, over a very long period of time. A simple example, there's no football culture. You've been here, you've seen the Saudi fans, you've seen the Tunisian fans, you've seen, you know, you talk to any Qatari over here, just as knowledgeable, just as passionate as anybody else, anywhere else in the world. This is a region that is in love with football. This is a region that football forms part of our daily lives, right? We follow every, you know, some of the people, you know, follow some of the most uh, 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 remote leagues in the world. And yet people on the outside don't know that we're a footballing culture, we're a footballing nation. The negative perspective that people have advanced, what do you think that's centered in? What do you think the motivation is? As I said, it fits, it fits into a stereotype. And unfortunately, I've seen some of the coverage, you know, that seems to be kind of pushing towards that, towards that stereotype what? of the Middle East. I'll give you an example. Cool. The um, Iran-Wales game. Iran played very good. Would you say so? Yep. yep. They played, you know, they were the better team. For yep. sure. Absolutely. Up until the 95th or 96th minute, right? And yet the coverage that we saw, for example, on BBC by Jurgen Klinsmann, Right, talking about how it's part of their culture and, 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 and reflecting, you know, the players in a way that was, I mean, you know, I, I hate using the word, but I'll, I will use it only once just because I never want to give power to the word. I've, I've uh, you know, it, it, very, very uh, uh, elitist, very orientalist, very racist to a certain extent. How do you mean elitist? Racist? Well, I will say it this way. When you're sitting down looking at what was happening and you're saying that's part of their culture, what do you mean by that? Was it misunderstood? Or was it was it a reflection that you know that he was he was representing, you know he was representing a culture, in a very negative way. We've got to touch on this, and we will. And this is what we're going to do now. Do you understand the strong feelings, from some Hassan towards this tournament, with these debates over human rights, and of course the acceptance of the LGBT community, the BBC not showing the opening ceremony, you were livid about that. The likes of Roy Keane on ITV saying that the World Cup should never be here in the first place. What do you want to say about instances like that 
you know, the significance of this tournament, right? This is the first World Cup in the Arab world, in the Middle East, in the Islamic world. This is a region that we said is steeped in football culture, tradition, and history, and passion. This is a region that is constantly misunderstood and misrepresented. And as the greatest cultural event in the world, which is what the World Cup it really is, it is a great opportunity for the world to come and get to know us for who we are and what we are, and what we stand for as well. And it becomes a cultural exchange between people. It's not between celebrities. It's not between <clears throat> media outlets. It, it's between the people on the street who sit down and, and celebrate. And that cultural exchange happens. And we can see that happening on the ground. It's not a, you know, for 13 years we've been talking about it. Now it's being delivered on the ground. And that's the most important element out of all of this, which is breaking down the stereotypes and misconceptions that people have, which means the need to engage. The reason is because it's a platform that allows you and gives you the opportunity to engage. When it comes to statements that come out, for example, from, from, you know, from Roy or from Gary or whoever else it is, there was no engagement. It's a statement that comes out based on no, you know, no engagement. No one pushed I mean, back on I mean, you know, Why was that? Did the they sad, not want the to engage part, with you? Well, uh, you know, just, just you know, the, the sad part, for, for example, for me, Gary Lineker, you know, as I was growing up, I, I looked up to him. You know, for me, when I was in Sheffield, I used to look at, you know, they think it's all, it's, it's all over. And for me, it was, it was a show that I used to love watching. I loved the banter. I loved the, you know, the sense of humor. I loved everything about it. Um, and so for me, it's very disappointing that, that Gary never bothered to engage. And I say it openly. He never bothered to engage. We reached out. We reached out many times. In February, we reached out over three or four times, specifically requesting to engage with Gary, to sit down and say, we understand your position. Give us the opportunity to put our case in front. At least hear, hear us out. If you don't agree then, that's fine. That's your decision, and that's your, and, and that's your judgment. But we never got the chance. There was never the desire to listen to our part of the story. We've always said it from day one, by the way, Everybody's entitled, of course, to their opinion and their judgment, but it's very important to understand the facts, understand the nuances, understand mm. the case, understand what happened on the ground. Look, when we come to worker welfare, for example, the organization that I'm responsible for, the Supreme Committee, which was in charge of delivering the stadiums, we've issued, for the last five or six years, we've issued three reports annually, one by us, one by us and Builders and Woodworkers International, which is an international trade union of which Unite in the United Kingdom is a member, uh, we've, uh, we've got also an independent auditor who issues a report as well, showing everything and showcasing our, our, our journey towards where today, you know, by the administrative Amnesty International itself in its last report, that our standards within the Supreme Committee are, 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 are very good, very high level standards. By the admission of trade unions, whether uh, uh, in Germany, in Switzerland, that the, st that the safety and security on our, st on our stadiums are on par with sites in Europe. This is the progress, and this is, this is the legacy that the World Cup is, is, is delivering on. Only here we could hear a story of a cameraman with the BBC being stopped from entering a stadium because he was wearing a rainbow watch. You hear about that? I think, I, I, I might have heard, but did, they, did he end up uh, going in? He, he, he may well in? have ended up going in. Look, I but, think... But the fact is, Hassan, as we understand it, he was stopped. That wouldn't happen... But, what wouldn't in happen? Europe, wouldn't happen. Wouldn't happen in Europe, well, you know, but let's be very clear. You know, from day one, we've said everybody's welcome, right? You we have. know. You have. We know, you know, but what we've always asked for is also for people to come and kind of, uh, you know, respect our culture, our religion. And it's not a Qatari culture or Qatari religion, right? This is a regional element. This is a regional, you know, these values that we're talking about are regional, right? It's for the Islamic world, it's for the Arab world, it's for the Middle East. And so what we're asking for is please everybody, everybody from every walk of life should come here, should engage, and, should, and, you've, and you've got people from all over the world and every part of, you know, uh, every, part of, every corner of the world here outside engaging and, 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 and educating themselves and having a good time. Um, but when it comes to a topic like this, it, it is a complicated topic. This is something for us that is, or for at least, you know, for, for, for this part of the world that, that, that's part of, you know, fundamental part of, of, of religious values. And this is what we want. We want the world to really come and get to see us, get to know us, get to understand us, and get to, get to accept the fact that we might not see eye to eye on everything. We might not agree on everything. There are certain values that we will not agree upon. But there's, a, but there's more that unites us, or there's more, more common ground that we have, and we need to find that common, common ground to find a way of saying, we might disagree on certain things, but let's find a way of moving forward. 
Let us find a way of moving, you know, of coexisting and moving forward one way or the other. And that's where I think mutual respect is fundamental. But you must have expected this, mustn't you? You must have priced this in to your thinking. You bought this uh, I priced, tournament. I, I'll you, tell you something. You, specifically you. You must I, have no, priced no, this No, no, I'll in. tell you something. I, I, I accepted the fact that you will find people and naysayers and critics, yes. I did expect, however, objectivity in terms of how it's covered. From the media. I did, yes. Yeah. And cer certain, cer certain media outlets. And absolutely. this is why we're doing this. I did expect, no, thank you. But I'm saying I, did ex I, I, I was expecting because I grew up on, 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 on some of these media institutions and, and I've had you know, nothing but absolute respect for them. And so I did expect an objective approach to it. Cover the bad, yep. show the good, let the, let the audience then make their call. So I'll ask uh, you again, before the end of the World Cup, we reach out to Lineker, will you reach out to Keane? 13 years, I'll tell you this much, Jim. 13 years, and I think um, not many people can claim that we haven't reached out to people and we haven't engaged and we continue to engage and we continue to sit down with our most ardent of critics and present our case. And more importantly, because there's, there's two things. There's was, one, we're able to bring the facts that we've got on the ground to, to, to our critics. But the second, the second reason is as well, we're able to listen from the critics themselves. We welcome constructive criticism and we welcome the opportunity for us to present our case and then whatever, whatever, whatever judgment that you come out with or whatever decision or whatever uh, uh, opinion you come out with, that's yours. I'm keen to know, Hassan, about where you're at with the, Qatar's relationship with FIFA. Because Infantino, he's gone from stick to football to a slightly bizarre opening address last weekend. I am Arab, I am gay. Have you spoken to Infantino since? I've spoken to him very briefly. I haven't had a chance to speak to him a lot. I mean, he's, he's been in different matches. I've been in different matches. What did you think I of what he said? I haven't met the president in a while. So, sorry? What did you think of what he said? I think... I think for a lot of people here in the Arab world and a lot of Qataris, I think what he said, you know, uh, to a large extent reflected the frustration of 13 years of kind of being presented in a certain way in the media, presented and you know, addressed in a certain way. Um, not just Qataris, but also Arabs. There's a lot of Arabs that I've talked to and have spoken to um, that, have, that have, you know, admired what he said. It's addressed the fact that people did feel that the outside world is coming and passing judgment unequivocally on our part of the world, on us as people, on us, you know, and again, like I said, it's not on Qatar but it's on the Arab world in the Middle East. A lot of people felt that. With what he was expressing, I think it represented a lot of the frustrations that a lot of people may have had. Or, or sorry, not may have, but actually have. Did he get his message over the way he intended? Well, I think that's for you to, 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 to judge. I mean, I think, like I said, you know, he went in, he spoke, he represented, like I said, a lot of, a lot of the feelings that a lot of people, a lot of part of the world over here feel, simple as that. I thought Infantino's outburst was a preposterous moral overreach in terms of a lack of control and moral control in terms of where he wanted to take it because we've listened to Infantino. I think there's lots of questions to answer about FIFA and the way that they operate. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with FIFA as an organization, but you, maybe you'll speak to that, maybe you won't. But the idea that we've listened to Infantino, you want this tournament, and I understand the infrastructure that you're building, you're building a country up, and the enormous, if you're gonna take and um, spend 115 billion on building the infrastructure of La Salle and metros and football stadiums and whatever else to get a GDP growth that's 27% or 25%, it's a phenomenal set of achievements that you guys are doing here. And when I look at it pragmatically and objectively, I think it is phenomenal. I think people need to get to grips with what you're trying to achieve here, and what the Football World Cup will be a gateway to help you achieve. But I do feel that Infantino's, um, this should be about the football tournament and for Infantino to turn it into something about whether it can be used for a ceasefire in the Ukraine-Russian conflict, to turn it into a debate about what he is and what he isn't. He isn't an Arab. He isn't a migrant worker. He isn't gay. But just to be, so just you to can't be, make those observations and make it about that. But, I think it's a lack you know of moral family, control. You know, you know, you know his, his, family, his family is Arab. Okay. Right? I mean, that's, that's, that's an important f f you know, point to point out. He is, you know, but again, I, I just want to say, Hassan, he spent too much time over here and influence has been getting into his ear about what he could and shouldn't be saying. I, I think the least he says now, the better if it is for him. And the, uh, and the tournament itself is under your I understand that, but if anybody's, at, well, actually it's, I'll get to that. Well, the presentation so, sorry, of Qatar is under I'll, your I'll, jurisdiction. I'll address that in a second, but just, just to clarify one thing. I mean, you know, uh, uh, if you've met, you know, uh, Gianni Infantino, you know that, you know, it's, it's very difficult to influence him. He's, 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 you know, he's got his views and his opinion in terms of, in terms of matters. So I'll just, I'll just leave that, leave it at that. I think, 
uh, when it comes to, you know, if, it's, if it should be about football and addressing football, the reality is a lot of the coverage that's come out there, the way the BBC covered the opening ceremony yep. is not about I football. Agree. I agree. Right? I agree. You know, the way Gary Lineker took three minutes. They never bothered to do that with any other tournament. I agree. With any other tournament. They never bothered to listen to the other side or at least present a balanced view to be able to sit down and, 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 and move forward. You know, so, so, that, so there's definitely agendas that are presented very clearly that are beyond football. So if there's ever a pushback on, on certain fronts or from whoever it may, may, may be, for me, I want it to be simple. I want it to be about football and I want it to be about the fans. It's, very, it's as simple as that. And I want it to be about how this tournament, not only this tournament, but we want to create, a, we want to create a, a, a blueprint of how tournaments can really be transformative on many different fronts, not just in terms of 28 days or 30 days of, of, of football, but how it can really leave a legacy beyond the tournament or even before the tournament. There was controversy early on about player protests, the one love armbands. It never took place because of the threat of FIFA sporting sanctions for the teams, for the players. Was that a directive that came from FIFA or the Qatar World Cup Supreme Committee? Clear that up for me. Uh, it's a FIFA decision. Did you get involved in it? No, I wasn't part of that discussion, no. But I mean, let's, you know, again, having said that, sorry, let's just take a step back in terms of, you know, I think FIFA, you know, P FIFA's, if I'm not mistaken, their policies, they've got these armbands in terms of, you know, like representing and discussing, you know, uh, 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 inclusivity um, and a number of different topics, sustainability and so yeah. on and so forth. But were you nervous about uh, the One Love armbands? Be honest with me, Hassan. No, I wasn't, I wasn't nervous about it. But for me, it was, you know, if, if the teams decided to do it throughout the entire season, that was one thing. If they're coming to make a point or a statement in Qatar, Right. That yeah. isn't that, that that is something that I take that, 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 you know, that I have an issue with. And again, it goes back to the simple fact that, you know. This is a part of the world that has its own set of values. Right. And again, this is a part of the world. This is not Qatar. I'm talking about the Arab world that has its own set of values for the teams to come and preach or make statements. That's fine. But then, you know, where, where you know. You what you're if, if, if essentially saying is. You're protesting an Islamic country hosting an event. So where does that end? Does that mean that you know, no Islamic country can ever be able to participate in anything? Or, or, you know, because again, like I said, there's going to be different values and different views coming in. So for me, if you're going to come specifically to make a statement here in Qatar or specifically addressed to Qatar and, and by extension the Islamic world, then of course I, 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 you know, I take a heart at that. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it leaves a very divisive message. We're saying everybody's welcome, mm. and we're saying every, and, and we want the people to come and experience it for themselves on the ground, and that's the most important element. And again, I know, I know people back home, people who might be listening to this, will say, you know, but but it's a bad experience, it's a horrible experience. But I urge you, gentlemen, you've gone out, yeah. you've talked to people, and you've seen the fans, yeah. and you've seen the celebration that's happening out there, and that is, that is the most important part. You know, seeing is believing. Being able to come and experience it for yourself, and understand the cultural exchange is the most important element. I understand that fully, Hassan, but th there are side issues all over this World Cup because of where we are. I mean, the European Parliament this week continued to ask Qatar and FIFA to extend compensation for families of workers who suffered and died whilst building the infrastructure for this World Cup and the stadiums involved. Do you intend to implement that? In relation to that element, there is a uh, Workers Supporters Insurance Fund that's been in place, uh, if I'm not mistaken, since 2018 or, or before that, I think 2000, 2018, uh, of which about, I think it's, you know, about $350 million have been paid from that fund to workers. Uh, and uh, the Minister of Labor, who's, who's the individual responsible uh, 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 for, these, for these matters, um, has indicated, and I think he, to the European Parliament itself, he's made a statement to the European Parliament itself that in the event that there's any case, any, any issue that's, uh, you know, any individual cases that are out there to be presented to the Ministry of Labor for them to look into it and resolve it. The infrastructure overall that was being built is infrastructure that is used for the development of the country. It's not specific for the World Cup. And every individual and every worker that's come here has contributed to the development of our country. Every worker that is, that is set foot here, you know, uh, to find a better living for their for their families, to be able to support their families back home, is part of our society. They are part of our society. Sure, they have contributed 
to our to it you know to, to, to the future of this country and so the systems that we put in place the reforms that we put in place whether it's the country reforms whether it's the supreme committee reforms come from our values come from our belief system and to ensure that the safety security health and dignity of anybody working in qatar is protected and is enhanced understood understood what do you think the, the world cup has done hassan um and can yet still do for this region in in terms of from perception to moral values first and foremost you know what has it done for the region right let's start with that in 2021 we hosted the arab cup right it was a tournament for all the arab nations all the arab countries to participate in and you know just just the arab people just coming together celebrating football was something that i think played on the emotions of of everybody and i'm not talking about only the arab world people living in the arab world i'm talking about the arab diaspora as well the people in uh, in australia the lebanese in australia um the the uh, bahrainis living in uh, uh england uh, the omanis living in uh, the us everybody they were tuning in to watch this right because it was an arab tournament this tournament we've you know now the world cup is here the first arab middle eastern islamic world cup right um it's just being held in Qatar. We're just hosting it, but it is an Arab World Cup. And what it's done for the people of the region, every single person walking on the street, every Arab walking on the street, every Middle Easterner walking on the street, feels that this is their World Cup. And I'll give you a simple example just for people to understand. When Saudi plays here, they're playing on home ground. When Tunisia plays here, they're playing on home ground. When Morocco plays here, they're playing on home ground. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's a magical feeling. It's, 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 it pulses when you go in. And, you feel, and like I said, every other team, when they mm -hmm. face them, they feel that they're playing, you know, they're playing an away game. And yet well, in the background, as you know, do you pay a lot of attention to it still? This noise that will exist, that the awarding of this World Cup to Qatar w was rooted in allegations of corruption. It's been looked at, it's been investigated, and it's been cleared. What more can I say? Even Blatter said days ago it should never have been staged here. He was the man that brought Qatar's name out of the envelope. I can't call, well, I mean, I think Blatter was very clear as to where he wanted it to go. Yeah. You know, he was very clear from day one where he wanted it to go. Um, and, and so, you know, I can't comment on that. I mean, you know, he obviously, it was not, was not where he wanted it to go. But I'll tell you something. Um, are you trying to tell me that this part of the world does not deserve its time in the sun? We do not deserve that's our not time to be there? That's not the point, is it? No, no, but no, no, but, no, no, no but because, because when he said it doesn't, no, he, I'm referring to the, Bla the Blatter statement. Yeah. Right? That's what I'm referring to. Even though, you know, funnily enough, Seb Blatter was a pioneer in terms of taking it to, you know, taking the World Cup to different parts of the world. Mm. You know, Africa, he was mm -hmm. the first person to push it towards Africa. You know, that, that in itself is, 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 is something, at least in his legacy. Um, when it comes to the issues of corruption, as I said, we've been investigated, investigated thoroughly. To simply put it, the Michael Garcia report, if you look in relation to our part, there's, an, there, there's a statement there that he was very clear in that people seem to gloss over. The level of enga engagement and the level of transparency that we've offered Michael Garcia when he was doing his inve in investigation, he commended us for it. Because we showcase, you know, we, we, were, we are acting as if he had the authority to demand any document that he wanted. We worked very professionally and very transparently and very openly with him, in which he states it in the, the report itself. And if you read the report thoroughly, there's a lot of these allegations that are out there that he himself says facts on the ground indicate that the claims or the accusations are false. It's, on the, it's, it's, it's in black and white. For anybody who wants to, they can go take a look at it. Having said that, that is a chapter that is over. I just wanted to address it for you just to put, in, you know, put it towards you. Uh, seeing as you asked the question, but that is a chapter that is over. Today, the Arab World Cup, the first Arab World Cup is here. Today, football one of the three history is being created. It's one of the three cornerstones that I alluded to at the beginning of this discussion about the reasons why the resistance and the pushback and seemingly the one-dimensional 
assault upon everything this World Cup in people's minds doesn't have. No one's really talking about the things that you're talking about, which is the positives, you know, the fact that we've got a World Cup that has because people integrating, that people are enjoying it. People aren't talking about ridiculous subjects like cultural appropriation as some sort of weapon to hit people around the head with. People are not addressing the issue of having stadiums that are geographically situated that people can watch three games in an afternoon, in a, in a day. All of these are unique experiences. Absolutely. But this issue of corruption around FIFA and Qatar is something that I feel you're addressing it and you're pointing at the Garcia report and that's fine to do but I also think it was your gift during the eight or nine years building up to this tournament 10 12 years 13 years to really get it front and center and take away the the attack of what people perceive it to be which is a World Cup or two World Cups back to back that were hijacked by forces and motivations and uh, outlooks that were fundamentally wrong Simon I mean England bid for 2018. England participated in the yep. bid. Everybody participated in the bid. Broadcasters bid for the rights for two World Cups. Whether it was a right call or not a right call or whatever else it is or whatever nefarious uh, you know, motivations that you, that you allude to, I can't comment on that. We saw an opportunity. 2022 was presented. We bid for 2022. We were, very, we were I think at the time, we were the only bidding nation that was very clear we went just for 2022 everybody else had their you know we're hedging their bets between 2018 and 2022 we were clear from day one we're going to 2022 what i'm saying though is at the time everybody was participating everybody participated nobody raised issues about the you know the d dual uh, bidding process and so on that's not for me to comment on it we ran our bid we we looked at what c were perceived as weak points in our bid and we turned them into positives the size of the country was considered a negative element. We talked about a compact World Cup. Yep. We talked about the ability to see mm. th more than three, three, four matches a day. Now, since we've won, a lot of people ridiculed that. Yep. A lot of people laughed at it. A lot of people said, you know, it's, 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 it's just unimaginable. You see it happening. The promise that we made in, 20, in, in 2009, 2010 is being delivered. What made it the best bit? Because when we spoke yesterday, we talked about it. visions. People don't see visions no, until no, no. a vision arrives. No, no, no. You were building an infrastructure that didn't exist. All the other countries that were bidding for this World Cup had the frameworks. They had the stadiums. They had the infrastructure. They had the travel links. They had everything in place. You must have sold them one hell of a vision to have got them to move away I from will, conventional I will, thinking. I will say this, gentlemen, and after that, I'm going to say, you know, let's move on. But let me tell you what made us the best bid. And sure. Give me just a bit of your time. Yeah, because. Go ahead. We were a young team that started uh, the journey, um, you know, with thinking outside the box. So we've, we looked at different opportunities that we were present in, and how can we make a statement, how can we showcase, and how we can make an impression. The other aspect that was very strong about us was, um, you know, simple fact that people liked us, and we spoke different languages, and we engaged with people on a, on a, on a, on a personal level. You know, being able to speak French, Spanish, Arabic, English, most of the other bids were very one-dimensional. I mean, you know, the English bid, for example, at a point in time, it was when David Dean came on board later on that, you know, things kind of started looking up, looking relatively well for the English bid, but at a point in time, it was very one-dimensional. I say this with a lot of respect for the people who were running the bid at the time. We started off the bid, we didn't know anybody, nobody knew us in the world of football. We ended up the bid knowing nearly everybody within the world of football. I'm not talking only about the decision makers. <clears throat> I'll give you an example of a turning, or, or, and I'll address a turning point for me that showcases what I'm talking about. In, I think it was February in Angola, if I'm not mistaken, I think, you know, we gave a speech to, 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 to the African nations in, in the uh, African Congress, in CAF's Congress. And the essence of the speech was very plain and simple. <clears throat> it was in the lead up to the South African World Cup. It was at the time when every single news agency as well, media outlet outside, was, was, was bashing South Africa and saying it was going to be one of the worst tournaments yep. ever, right? And we plain and simply told, you know, the African nations, we hear you. The Arab world is also suffering from the same perception. You will host a great tournament. And at the same accord, what you're facing and what you're going through right now, you know, this is our opportunity now to use this tournament to be able to change people's minds as well. And, 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 and it resonated. That message resonated within, within the African federations. I'm not only talking about the decision makers, I'm talking about the entire African re uh, uh, federation. Mm -hmm. It resonated within them. It's the ability to, we, we, we took this tournament, you know, the first World Cup in the Arab world in the Middle East, and all the issues that it faced, and for the rest of the world, for the outside world, they saw, the, they, they, they saw you know, parts of them in it. 
They saw parts of them in it. So it's the first that's, winter. That's, sorry, that's one aspect. Go on, Hassan. The second aspect comes in terms of the technical aspect. The concept of the compact World Cup means more than one match a yep. day. More than one match a yep. day. For a lot of people, that was something that they, in their mind, they, uh, you know, it, 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 it was a great opportunity. It was an innovative concept. It was an innovative idea. Um, and then bringing it down to the fact that, you know, it's easy to get to Qatar. That was another aspect. For a lot of these other, you know, a lot of these other host countries, it was quite a hassle to get to them. In Qatar, it was to a certain extent centrally, well, it depends relatively where you're at, but it was centrally located. The east and the west can easily get to Qatar, it was easily accessible. In terms of broadcasting, because of a geographical location, it had the widest audience available in terms of broadcasting. And to top it all off, our final presentation. Now, you know, one of my biggest frustrations is that we, we don't, I don't have a footage of the final presentation. But the final presentation, we spoke in French, Arabic, Spanish, and in English. We were the only bid that a female had a prominent role. As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, I might be mistaken here or there, but we were the only bid that actually, that a female role had a speaking part in it. Yours Her was Highness, the only bid. Her, Her Highness Sheikha Moza came out and spoke about what this World Cup meant for the Arab world in the Middle East and why it was time now for this tournament to come. I, I don't believe any other bid had a, had, had, had a, had a female participating actively in, in, their, in, in their bid. So put it all together, we came in, you know, uh, we, we, during the journey as well, and, and you could talk to a lot of people, whether it was Soccer X, we had a very prominent prom uh, 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 presence in there. Uh, whether it was Leaders in Football, we had a prominent presence in there. Innovative way of delivering our messages. Innovating way of kind of, you know, engaging with people. These are the factors. So it's the first Winter World Cup, will it be the last? That's not with me, that's a decision that FIFA will take, that's a decision, you know. <laughs> This is, this, is, this is a decision that I think, and addressing your point, yeah. if we go, come back towards your yeah. point about the bait and switch, that's, that's, you know, that definitely wasn't the case. Why? We bid for a Summer World Cup. You did? We bid for a Summer World Cup. Our cooling technology that we developed, we were very confident about it. It was used, utilized in one stadium at the time, which was Al Set Stadium. Then after that, we, met, we, we, you know, we went ahead uh, and, and you know, utilized, uh, developed the technology, uh, confident in its, in its efficiency, and at the same time, confident that it will leave a legacy beyond the stadiums. That's what we promised as well in our bid. Now, of course, after we won, I think, I think it's natural for people to kind of be a bit unsure about what they consider to be an untested technology. Mm -hmm. And so the decision was to move it to winter. From my, our side, we were a summer World Cup. When the decision was made to move it to winter by the football world, we embraced it and we moved on. It's as simple as that. So, Hassan, let's move on. From Paris Saint-Germain to Newcastle, live golf in Saudi Arabia, to boxing in the Middle East. Why is this region seeing sport as a key jewel in the crown? Why is Europe so obsessed by sport? Why is it okay to hold golf tournaments in Europe and in the States? Why is it okay to have boxing matches in Europe and in the States and in Japan, for example? Uh, you know, and, and, and people question what the importance of, the sport, of sports is in the Middle East. If you walk down the streets, you'll find avid fans of every kind of sport you can imagine and some you haven't heard of. So for me, the question honestly is a bit, it, it, it's a little bit strange because we have to sit down, you know, I feel like the, our part of the world has to justify our interest when, you know, since the start of the Premier League, you've had interests coming in from Russian uh, investors, you've had uh, interests coming in from uh, American private equity firms, American investors, um, you've had interests coming in from Chinese, from, 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 from Thai, um, yeah, and you know, from all parts of the world. So, so why not the Middle East? That's what you're saying. What I'm saying is, one, why not the Middle East? That's one aspect. And two, do people recognize, our, you know, people don't know the passion that we have for the world, for, 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 for sports. And like I said, sports are on its entire front. So would you seek an Olympic Games? I think we've bid a number of times. I don't know if we're going to continue bidding or not. That's a whole different uh, team that's responsible for it. But I, but I believe that, you know, uh, we've bid, we've shown our interest, we've shown our desire and motivation to host it. Yes. I, I, th I think that, that, you know, it's, it's on the books. But I think that's a, an easy answer for you. To, it's not about heritage. It's not about, the, you have the US PGA pushing back against the Live Tour. You have the UK uh, and the European PGA looking at it. But it's about the economics of 
the hyperinflation that this region brings to sport. And, and if you look at the Premier League, you're absolutely right. People forget Abramovich was the starting cannon for the way that finances. There were three events in, in the Premier League. There was the introduction of the Premier League and the broadcast deal that changed the direction of travel. Then as Abramovich landing in 2003, 2004, I was there in the Premier League with my side watching that mm -hmm. uh, explosion of cash. Then there was Sheikh Mansour. And you can put in the bit part players like Tiwanatra that owned Manchester City and a few other people, but the explosion of finances and the hyperinflation, because the trickle down economics of sport are real. They're not like economies where yeah. you, they do or don't work. They do happen. Mm -hmm. you, the top guys get paid top money, it trickles down through the pyramid. My concern, and it's always been my concern, is the nature of a, the motivation, because people question the motivations. They talk about sports washing. They're talking about the agenda of influence and the usage of sport to be able to carry and, and impart certain messages. And they also look at the economic landscape. So when you say, oh, hang on a second, what does Europe have the right? Why does Europe only have the, the, the precinct of having it? That's not what's being said. There's capitalism attached to sport. You know it. I know it. We're all grown-ups. I, th I, th I think both sides but are But the control mechanisms and the finances around the kind of money that's being brought in from this region is destabilizing i don't believe is good for the, the for the for the for the for the for the stability of sports and specifically in this instance football let me let me talk to you as a fan as a you know my, mm -hmm. my, my and this is again purely my personal opinion you know and i could be completely mistaken or, or you know I, I could have assumptions that are wrong right let me talk to you as a fan for me um the more competitive a league is the more competitive teams are the more exciting it is for us as fans and the more the more you know uh uh the best in players comes out, right? And that's one of the reasons I think out of all the leagues in the world, the Premier League is probably the best because you see the competition at the, t at the top and you can see the competition, the fierce competition at the relegation zones as well. And that's why I think it's, you know, it's, it's important to have, to a certain extent, uh, uh, you know, a level playing field, to a certain extent. But yeah. the reality is, as you indicated, over the years, that wasn't the case. Over the years, before Middle Eastern money ever came in, you said it, you know, People all of a sudden came in, and and you know the 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 um, the roof was always kind of punched through, mm -hmm. right? And the top of the top the top of the lid kind of punched through. Whether it was you know the advent of the I mean, for example, today for example, you know the Premier League has got the most amount of money, whereas the smaller teams right now in the Premier League can compete with some of the biggest teams outside sure. of Europe, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and some people say, you know, well, is that is that a level playing field a field or not? And that, that that leads you to a whole different discussion, which I don't want to get into. What I'm trying to tell you is. One, the economic evolution and the growth of money in sports has is, is, is been going on for many, many years before even Middle Eastern money came in. True. Right? Yep. Now, we can talk about the extent of it or, you know, the size yep. of it or so on, which I'll address in a second. Um, but the growth of the footballing industry in particular and sports in general has evolved over many, many years. Many years. Um, the that's been, that's been driven by broadcasters. Well, no, broadcasters, broad, well, broadcasters yeah. sponsors. Yeah. Don't forget the sponsors as well. Yeah, but they, they come sponsors. in hand with hand with the broadcasters. Fair enough. But, yeah. the point, but the point becomes, you know, it's, it's become a very, very lucrative industry and a very global industry and a very, uh, um, like I said, very, very uh, you know, there's but a lot of money. But it's hugely in challenging, Hassan, but, when but you've got me, nation me, states sorry, owning. Let me come to this. Let me just come to, the, let me come to the issue that you said, right? Yeah. Where it comes to. There are regulations that are put in place. And it's for the regulators to make sure that and the, equal, the, the, the playing field is I in agree. place. Yeah. I can't tell you, you know, I can't tell you what's, you know, uh, uh, what to do or not to do. What I'm telling you is the regulations themselves have to be put in a, such a way to create a level playing field. Some people are always going to have the advantage. The Real Madrid's and Barcelona's, yeah. they're not state the legacy nations, fights, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. They're always, they're always going to have, a, a, you know, a, a, a bigger, a bigger, Manchester United, you know, well, considering where they're at right now, but, you know, there's always going to be that competition and, and there's always going to be the competitive advantage they have. But in the end, there's got to be regulations put in place to create a level playing field. You, you said a moment ago, Hassan. And, and, and they're there, whether, whether they're efficient or not, in place, that's for you to decide. And you talk about, and when you talk about nation-state power, and you talk about the example of, of Manchester City, and it's, it's not necessarily this region, but it is this region, because it's, because it's this region that has that investment in Man City, not Qatar, mm. but Saudi. But you look at it and say, uh, no, uh, uh, UAE. UAE. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you, you, their response to the governance of the game is, we'll tie you up for 40 years with the economic power that we've got for the legal system that we will deploy. And that concerns me, that kind I can't, of influence I can't comment, and control. I, honestly, I, I don't know if that's the process that they're taking or that's that response. Mm. I can't comment on that. All I can say is there's regulations that, that, that were put in place. If they're not efficient, yeah, they need to be more efficient. I agree. 
and, and it's for other people, you know, it, because it's not good enough to say, well, you're not allowed to come in. You know, you, you know, you're from the Middle East, you're not allowed to come in. But you no, of course not. That's not the point no, I'm making. I know, I know, that's I know, not the point I'm making. No, no, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm, not, yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not even, you know, I mean, you, you, you're a Liverpool fan, right? Yes. Um, and you can talk as a fan, but has state ownership in sport driven the likes of FSG and, and the Glazers to seek fresh investment? Uh, you'll have to ask them that question. Uh, honestly, you have to ask them the question. What I can say, however, is, you know, FSG came in, um, <clears throat> reinvigorated the team, you know, uh, brought on board a, gr a great coach, brought on board great players, great players. And just to address this point, they brought on board, you know, uh, a, a Middle Eastern player, Mohamed Salah, and they brought on board a player like Sadu Mane, and a, a Muslim player as well, that have contributed, you know, just one, you know, one thing just to address in terms of Middle Eastern perceptions. You know, I think there was a Stanford study that kind of showcased that, um, you know, attacks or, or Islamophobic attacks kind of went down during the period of time that, or, you know, as Salah and, and Mani have been there uh, because it changed perceptions. And people, you know, fans are sitting down singing, what was it? Uh, if you score one or two or more, uh, I might become, uh, I can't remember what the chant was. <laughs> um, but, but there was a chant, you know, it changed people's perceptions of, of Arabs, of, 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 of Muslims and so on. Just So when we're talking about Middle Eastern involvement, mm -hmm. Yes, there's a the state investment. There's all that stuff that's coming on the other side that we just addressed. But there's also the other aspect. There's some fantastic, phenomenal players and talent that is out of here. The fans, people get to experience here today. But the talent, people are starting to experience it right now. Over the generations, we've had Mohamed Mido, who played in Tottenham, played in Roma. Mm. We had Amr Zeki, who played in, in, in uh, I think it was uh, Wolves. No, uh, uh, what was it? Wigan, Wigan. And he played in Wigan. I uh, am Jabra from Saudi. Uh, you know, th there's been great players coming in. So just, just to be clear, the influence of, the, or, or let's say the presence of the Middle East is not, and Ninni, who plays, plays in Arsenal, the presence of the Middle East is not only limited in terms of ownership. Yeah. The presence of the Middle East is also in the players that are, that, that are out understood, there. Understood, understood. Uh, but just going back to, to, to the point that you said, um, I think, I think, you know, They've done a great job with Liverpool. I, I don't know what the economics are. I don't know in terms of them looking for new investment or not, what, what, what the motivation behind it is. Um, all, I, all I can say is, for the sake of the sport that we all love, you know, I think it's very important that competitive balance is, is, is provided and is maintained. You know, so the sport continues being as exciting and as beautiful and as sometimes emotionally draining as it is. So Hassan, when it's all done, We've had the closing ceremony. It's goodbye from Qatar. What do you want people's takeaway to be from this tournament? So many. I mean, I, I think we need a new program for this. But the simplest one is that Qatar hosted a, a, a you know, World Cup where people from all different parts of the world came. Uh, they met, you know, they met and made friends with people they never would have had an opportunity to ever meet. They would have been engaged in cultures that they would have never thought they would have even given a chance to actually engage with. Um, that they would have uh, made friends and friendships that would have lasted a lifetime, hopefully. And at the very least, changed perception and accepted the fact that you're different and I'm different. But you know what? We can still have mutual respect with each other and we can still uh, uh, find a way of moving forward together. Um, because, I, like I said, there's a lot of things out there in this part of the world that, that really, you know, we can find many platforms that we can shout from the top of the mountains in terms of what makes us different and, you know, where we're at and the different sides of the arguments. But we need to find more and more opportunities that bring us together and, and create a mutual respect and a common, uh, common way forward.